Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you all very much indeed for uh, for joining me. I see quite a number of my friends amongst the audience. I'm, a, I'm really surprised they've joined us because they've heard me babbling on about this stuff for uh, for many years. But hopefully for some of you, some of it may be uh, some of it may be quite new. Um, this talk really follows on from the wonderful talk that the president of the Wild Trout Trust, John Beer, who's with us this evening, gave last year. And uh, I thought, uh, as I listened to John last year, that perhaps my take on trout and where trout have come from might complement quite nicely uh, what, uh, what what John was talking about, as I say, last uh, last December. So what we're really going to talk about really is this adaptation feature, which again, John laid a lot of emphasis on last year. But this is adaptation really towards the latter half of the talk into exotic habitats. Uh, everywhere from the high Andes to the South Indian Ocean. So we're going to take you on a little bit of a tour around the world. Um, and uh, this wonderful quote here, sea trout are estuary fish, nomads of the tides to whom all watery ways are familiar. That's an important quote to me now because my co-author here, Chris McCulley, and the, the main author of this book on uh, sea trout fishing in Ireland, Chris was kind enough to ask me to co-author the book with him. Um, Chris decided uh, in his inimitable style that he would call the book Nomads of the Tides. The reason I mention this is not to publicize the book, but to mention the fact that because of this, it gave me quite a lot of time to move around the coast of Ireland and to think a good bit about estuaries and small streams and what these funny fish were doing. And what they were doing was absolutely and completely extraordinary. I mean, they are the most amazing, uh, most amazing creatures. So let's just go back a little bit. Let's go back maybe 20,000 years. And certainly when I was in school, these are the sort of maps of Ireland that we used to get uh, from our geography teacher. And it was very convenient because the geography teacher always had an out. There was always a refugia, big or little, left uh, around the edge of Ireland so that he could explain why these creatures remained after the ice left. But we know now that that's not actually the case and that at the peak of uh, the ice around 20 to 26,000 years ago, the last glacial maximum, most of the British Isles was actually covered in ice. So anything that has come in has come in uh, to us from the ocean. But this area of ice was drained by gigantic ice streams, um, and they were etched in places by fringing ice shelves. And uh, this was very, very similar to today's West Antarctic ice sheet. And the British Irish ice sheet was twice as large as previously thought. And it was the marine based component of this had a lattice structure. And obviously, as a lattice structure, it was susceptible to sea level uh, induced collapse and contained numerous ice streams. And this greatly assisted the actual rupturing or the demise of the ice sheet itself. And when we talk about the Ice Age, I think we, we tend to think about it as a great big lump of ice that was solid and then thawed. But nothing could be further from, from the truth, because in reality, um, this huge mass of ice took thousands and thousands of years to actually disappear. And each major retreat of the ice was accompanied by a re-entrenchment of ice on the landscape. And it didn't retreat in a, in a single sweep, but in, this, in a series of these retractions as the western and northern parts of Ireland and Britain in turn became wholly or partially ice free. And around the time of the last glacial maximum, as I say, the sea trout and all of its close relatives were confined to the southern seas, such as, let's say, the Mediterranean, which is thought to have borne quite an, an uncanny resemblance to the Baltic as we know it today. So given the extent of the ice fields over Ireland and Britain, there's little doubt, I think, that trout were not present in our rivers and lakes in, uh, in Ireland and Britain uh, more than about 14,000 years ago. And assuming that fish breed on average, say, every three years, this only represents about, uh, about uh, 4,000 generations. This is a blip in the time continuum that encompasses the evolutionary history of the trout. And they colonized our rivers and our lakes in a surprisingly short period of time. And as we go through the talk and as we discuss this later on, please keep in mind that this is one of the most successful invasive species that's around the globe at the moment. 
If we didn't have brown trout and someone introduced brown trout, we might be behaving in the same way as we were behaving at the mo- at the moment uh, uh, with regard to the threat from pink salmon. So that's that's uh, that's something just to keep in mind. The really interesting thing for me is the fact that you have this enormous variety in shapes and colors and in biology. And uh, my old friend Ed Fahey, who wrote a wonderful book on sea trout called Child of the Tides many decades ago, he finished the book, and it was something that I remember very clearly, by saying, look, this is so complicated. I'm not actually sure we should be calling these things sea trout. We should be calling all of these fish migratory trout. And I think this will come back to us several times as we go through the talk. Um, one point I want to make about this, which I'll come back to when we get to the Falklands a little later on. Um, in Ireland, for many years, we had an extraordinary strain of trout. It was from a Surrey fish farm and it was inbred. And as a result of that, for some strange reason, it was very, very poor at reproducing when it went out into the wild. But it did actually survive quite well. So before triploids, this was the stock of fish that was used, stock rivers in Ireland. And I found as my career progressed at the early stages that I was picking up these silverfish in estuaries and in the sea. And these silverfish turned out actually to be Ross Cray strain Surrey trout. These were, we were told, these were resident fish. And in my local river, which is only about two kilometers from where I'm sitting here, the River Dodder in Dublin, on some of the surveys, we picked some of these fish up at nine pounds weight. And the biggest, biggest fish, that nine pounder, because of the frayed fins and so on on the back, I'm absolutely convinced that may, that may have been an actual brood stock that was stocked into the river. So this is just part of this enigma. These fish are just so strange. Just look at the coats, look at the colors, look at the shapes. Everywhere you go, Russia on the right hand side, you know, right across then to Argentina on the bottom left, no matter where you go, you have all these shapes and colors. Connemara in the middle. So, you know, it's basically a United Nations of fish is what it's actually actually producing. Wonderful shapes, colors, and the biology to match that as well. But let's look at one particular component of this, because it may offer us some explanations in terms of what exactly are the features that are most important to us in terms of this ability that these fish have to adapt. And in recent years in Ireland and Britain, there's been this amazingly uh, uh, intense interest in the conservation and management of small streams. This has come really over the last 10 years or so. And what we in, in the game would call first and second order streams, basically the small streams. And these constitute a major proportion of the overall river length. And remember that in Europe, for example, 80% of all river systems by length comprise small streams. And very often these are very little surveyed because you're talking about sometimes trickles. And because of their size and their small streams, they're particularly vulnerable, both to general pressures and to specific problems. But they do provide important spawning habitats. And they're very easily blocked by impassable culverts, by farm crossings, by minor land use changes. And they're adversely affected by minor land management practices as well. What might be a minor land management practice might indeed be uh, you know, something that would impact uh, disproportionately on the small streams. And these small streams are, um, they're very poorly protected in general. Okay, so in terms of the small coastal streams, they have over the years received little if any attention really, uh, but they are really, they're really important to us. And I just want to, um, I just want to concentrate on them for a minute, okay? So um, we have very large numbers of coastal streams around the coasts of Britain and Ireland, as we know. And the interesting thing is, and this goes back to nomads, because all of these tiny streams, some of them harmless looking little coastal streams, everywhere we looked, we found an abundance of trout fry. So let me give you an example, because the example hopefully will make the point. So this is in Bangor in County Down in Northern Ireland, and this is beside my friend's house. So he had just moved into the house and they moved in around August time, and this was his favorite walk out there in front of you, up and down that beach. So late October, early November, he was out with uh, his springer, walking along the beach. He crossed, jumped across this little trickle, and 
he heard the dog barking and he went further along the beach and he heard the dog barking and he kept calling the dog and he kept asking the dog to come back and no way would the dog come over to him. So he walked towards the mouth of this little stream and he suddenly realised there was fins all around where the seagulls are. He then looked upstream and this is what he saw. This tiny little urban stream. This little stream fortuitously hadn't had any misconnections, hadn't had any pollution problems. And because of that, it was serving very well as a little spawning channel for the trout. And he's been monitoring this stream ever since for me, just visually, just sending me little notes and photographs. But he has seen fish of close to four pounds entering this tiny little stream. And he really, really had to hunt to try and put a name on the stream. So that's just to emphasize the fact that these small little streams, they are really, really important. And um, the surveys carried out in the 1980s by the Central Fisheries Board, and more recently, the Celtic uh, Sea Trout Programme, uh, which looked in detail at sea trout in England, uh, Wales, uh, Ireland and Scotland. Um, they have clearly shown that even very small, short coastal streams again hold these very large numbers of fry. And a notable feature is the tendency for the fry to move or to be flushed downstream. And this is an important feature for me because one of the first rivers I looked at as a young biologist was in County Don Donegal in Northwest Ireland. And I found these very small, slightly silvery fish down at the river mouth, actually in the brackish water. And my boss completely and totally refuted the idea that in some way these fish were actually happily living in these pools. He said, oh, no, no, they've been flushed down, Ken. There's no way they can live in these pools. So let's leave that for a moment. We'll come back to that in a little minute. Um, and it is the lower freshwater and estuarine pools that often hold the highest number of these little juvenile trout. Uh, many have a steep gradient to these little streams and uh, the fish migrate when they migrate upstream, it can often be, uh, the streams can be blocked either naturally by rock barriers or indeed by man-made blockages of various sorts. And reports from these streams always claim that the adult fish tend to hang out in the ocean or in the slightly brackish water until they are quite mature. And the females are often heavy laden with eggs and close to maturity on their return, right up on a rainfall event into these streams to lay the eggs. And as I said before, sea trout of quite a significant size can be in these streams, but only fleetingly. And again, my experience has been that when I talk to local groups, particularly local community groups, I do a lot of that sort of work over the last te decade or so, just helping people to look after their local streams and rivers. People deny that there are any big fish in these rivers, but of course they're not there in the middle of November when these fish are actually, are actually coming uh, up the stream to spawn. Um, when we were researching nomads, the sea trout book I mentioned earlier, we found very significant numbers of sea trout, particularly finnock, gathering in bays and in estuaries remote from sea trout fisheries. And this often happened in the autumn time, right up to Christmas. For example, the River Ban in Northern Ireland, as we sit here, I'm sure is still replete with all sorts of shoals of sea trout, including some quite significant fish, but a lot of finnock and a lot of fish overwintering in these sort of uh, semi-saline habitats. And we argued in our book that actively feeding sea trout that we encountered in such bays, and generally indeed along the coastline, that they're indicative of the additional contribution to marine recruitment of sea trout that can come from these very small streams. And recruitment from such small streams may be of critical importance, we think, to the abundance of sea trout in certain coastal margins and may make the difference in terms of whether or not they're actually worth fishing or not. So we think they're very much a hidden and an unknown resource. So back to these little guys that are actually in the semi-salt water. Well, in Norway, young sea trout may abandon their nursery streams and move to salt water very early in life. And when born in extremely small trout streams, they extend their feeding habitat and avoid periods of drought by moving to sea at an early life stage. And when the par leave fresh water during their first year of life, they appear to need this brackish feeding area at the outlet of the natal, natal stream where they can feed and survive. And it may be to do with adaptation to the salt as well. And brown trout from small streams on the Baltic island of Gotland may move to sea soon after emergence 
Now, this is a life history strategy that certainly I thought until recently was confined to some of the Pacific salmon species. And some fish in the Baltic may even spawn in brackish water. And it's known that eggs and fry of sea trout may survive if the salinity is below five parts per thousand. So the little silverfish that I saw at, at the early stages in my career, um, they were more than likely, they were actually living in those tiny little pools. So it's a continuum. I mean, this idea that we have fish in freshwater, that we fish in the salt water, with sea trout, you throw out the book. And certainly in this case, you throw out the book because as I say, it's linked right across both environments. And adult sea trout also have adapted to return later in season, as, as I mentioned earlier, and at times can reach an appreciable size. On the River Erif system on the west coast of Ireland, where I worked for many years, we did a, a quite a detailed study looking at the egg deposition from sea trout. And surprisingly, we found that just two year classes, one and two sea winter maiden sea trout, provided nearly 90% of the eggs. We also found that, uh, as is the case in a lot of situations like this, that the physical nature of the transitory coastal streams, um, like in the case of the cutthroat trout, um, it's likely that few fish from such streams spawn more than once. So nature, again, had worked with the trout to adapt to individual specific environments. So let's see then how that translates in terms of some of the more exotic locations where you find sea trout. Um, those of you who are trout anglers like myself, and I think most of you probably are, you've probably dreamed about fishing in New Zealand. And some of us, including myself, have been fortunate to do so. But certainly when I went fishing for the first time in New Zealand, maybe about 12 or 14 years ago, I had no idea there were, there were really good numbers of sea trout um, in the uh, coastal regions of New Zealand. This is what New Zealand meant to me. It was beautiful lush rivers. It was plenty of growth, plenty of food, beautifully marked brown trout. But then my friend here on the, uh, on the bottom left um, started to send me photographs of the sea trout that he was catching along the west coast of the South Island. And then when I joined him, I was lucky enough to get some of these fine fish myself. And that particular fish that's in the landing net there he led, led me a, a merry dance. I actually eventually landed him in the Pacific surf. So that's exotic enough for you in terms of where sea trout may end up. But what about when the fish were stocked and the history of how this came about? Because trout were only stocked in the 1880s for, for the first time in New Zealand. Uh, so you're looking at a situation where these are in the sea. They are sea run browns, but would we call them sea trout? In a little over 140 years, we have found that in the rivers in New Zealand, particularly a big river like the Clutha, which is a beautiful tributary river called the Pamahaka, where a lot of the migratory fish actually spawn, it actually has within its river system um, many of the types of trout that you would normally find in our rivers. So in just that small period of time, they have adapted not just to different locations, but they have adapted and they have actually formed different life history formats in that particular area. Let's move across then and have a look at another country where I, I've worked a good bit in Chile. Chile is really very interesting because again, it's a, it's, it's a country of extremes. It's a massively long, thin country stretching for some 2,800 miles. Um, very narrow, as you all know, but it comprises 15 regions. And the regions I've worked in are the famous lakes region and the rivers region. And there was originally 44 native species. There was small cyprinid-like galaxids and some perch species. But there were none of these fish really reached any appreciable size. And um, certainly uh, the vast river and lake systems, surprisingly, were devoid of any major food fish or sport fish, of course. And fish rearing only commenced in 1841. And interestingly, when they started fish rearing in Chile, it had nothing to do with developing sport fisheries at that stage. They were looking at how to supplement the actual food of the local farmers. Um, in 1904 in, in Chile, then, they purchased trout and Atlantic salmon over. And over the following years, substantial numbers of fish, both trout and salmon, were imported into Chile. 
So just look at those numbers. 1905, 400,000 ova, just a big mix of species. 350,000 in 1906. Um, 20,000 brook trout are beginning to come in then from Argentina, all sorts of different things. For, and 1908, half a million Atlantic salmon fry, um, brown trout, rainbow trout from various locations, and also Pacific salmon, Chinook. So basically, kitchen sink time, throw everything at it and see what sticks. And um, the availability of trout eggs from Chile has made a very big difference uh, in that Southern Oceans area because it has given uh, uh, the availability of ova, given that option to people. And I think that helped in terms, certainly in terms of the spread of brown trout and rainbow trout in Argentina, the, the, the neighbour of Chile. Um, but it's a land, a land, obviously, of very active volcanoes and very rich seas. And you have this excellent mix of browns and rainbows. But what surprised me when we were doing our surveys there was despite the fact that we were finding uh, sea run fish, it was sea run browns we were finding. We weren't finding sea run rainbows. Again, I don't know what sea run really means. We did find them in estuaries, but we certainly didn't find what I would see as steelheads, though I have seen references recently to steelheads now appearing at some of the rivers in Argentina. But the interesting thing was that some of the fish that had been stocked had very distinctive morphological features that they'd retained. So we had uh, in one area what, where, what were described to us as German browns, which is really a term I think I've often heard by uh, used by friends from the US. But these were extraordinarily, uh, if the fish will pardon me, ugly looking fish, very snub nosed. There's a picture here of Francisco, my friend, with one of them. And they're in the Moline River. And these creatures now do actually run to sea, despite the fact, again, that they would have been originally seen as a resident fish. And in the Pacific, they find the most excellent feeding and both in the near shore and in the uh, and in the offshore as such. So this area here around Puerto Montt, this is where I was based. I did a lot of work in this area here and right down along this area here. And the most extraordinary thing about uh, Argentina, about Chile, is the fact that the densities of fish in these very rich rivers are very, very high. The massive great salmon that you see there, they're all Chinook. And they're really, uh, at this stage now, very widespread in that southern area of Chile and increasingly widespread in Argentina. But one of the main reasons for putting this slide up is, some of you may recognize this. This is a tiger trout, and a tiger trout that was a cross between a brown trout and a brook trout. I had never seen one of those before. I'd only ever seen them as pictures in some of the UK angling magazines, because I thought they were something that was artificially produced. But in Chile, because of the fact that they had, as I mentioned earlier, brook trout from uh, originally from Argent came in from Argentina, there was brook trout and brown trout in some of the upper reaches of some of the rivers we looked at. And when I had some students working with me, I suddenly realized that some of the fish they were categorizing as um, they were categorizing as brookies, excuse me, were in fact these um, uh, these lovely little tiger trout. So again, you know, in all of these salmonids, you have this tendency uh, to, to adapt and the tendency to move. So the next uh, example I'd like to look at is the Falkland Islands. And um, I've never been to the Falkland Islands, but um, I was friends with the late Peter Lapsley. And Peter and I used to talk about this whole phenomenon of the, uh, of the migratory fish and of the uh, ability of these fish to adapt to new and exotic locations. And if you go fishing for sea trout in the Falklands and you come across a little guidebook by Peter, you'll actually see a little section in it about my little river Dodder here, because he asked me to write a little section about um, the various uh, um, groups of fish that I had encountered that were obviously fish that had come from fish farms and that had actually made it into the ocean and came back as silver fish. He again was, was fascinated with this. So the success of the sea trout we know about in the Falklands was down to Chile. And the trout were established with the assistance of the availability of these brown trout over in Chile. And uh, 80, 90 years ago, neither brown trout nor sea trout existed. So um, the stocking only took place from the 1940s onwards with a small batch imported from Chile. And they later sent 30,000 more as a gift 
And this was, this was augmented by another 35,000 then from Britain. Um, but the biggest of 19 sea trout caught in one extraordinary day's fishing by Alison, Alison Faulkner, that you see here up in the, in, in the image, very poor image, in 1992, weighed 22 pounds and 12 and a half ounces. And it was two and a half ounces heavier than the UK record at the time. And in the early days, distribution of the imported Chilean and British trout fry was makeshift. They were transported in milk churns, carried in panniers on horseback and in water butts on board the inter-island mail steamer, the RMS Fitzroy. And again, as we worked in Chile, we heard these stories, most extraordinary stories about people spreading these fish around the place. And my uh, granduncle, who was in the British Army, he actually helped to stock uh, trout into the Himalayas. And again, when he was stocking trout, according to my dad, in the Himalayas, this was the sort of regime that was in place. Panniers using uh, water tanks of various sorts. How these fish survive, they're just extraordinary in terms of their ability to be able to survive the long journeys and survive the journeys inland then to the rivers where they were actually planted. This just looks a, uh, like a blank map of the South Pacific, but it's not blank because here is the Falkland Islands. And I would offer if we were on uh, in a situation where we were off mute rather, I'd offer someone a point if they could actually tell me what that little tiny spot there is. Because up to about 10 years ago, I had no idea that those little islands existed. So these islands here are known as the Kerguelen Islands and they're in the southern in Indian Ocean. And the Kerguelen Islands were discovered in 1772. There are several hundred islands located in the southern Indian Ocean, and they're near the Ana Antarctic Convergence in the Indian Ocean southern sector. And there was no permanent settlement on the Kerguelen Islands until 1950, when Port-au-Francais was established. And currently about 60 to 100 people are stationed on the Kerguelen Islands, either at Porto Francais Research Station or in small field shelters located in various parts of the islands. And the closest mainland is Antarctica and Madagascar is the closest inhabited country, some 3,500 kilometres away. So this is an extraordinary place to carry out an experiment and an experiment was carried out. All river systems of the Kerguelen Islands were originally devoid of any fish fauna, none at all, at all. And between 51 and 91, 22 importation attempts took place, involving about 2 million individuals. And um, of the seven species introduced, just a few of them have made good. But again, kitchen sink time. Throw everything at it. Atlantic salmon, brown trout, chinook, coho, lake trout, brook trout, arctic char. 23 catchments were stopped, and at present 45 watersheds are colonised by one or several introduced species, the browns, the brook trout, the arctic char. They've all done reasonably well, but the fish that has done really, really, really well is the brown trout, of course. It was the only species to colonise a large number of watersheds, 32 in about 10 generations. Its successes, well, they, as we know by this stage, can be explained by the diversity of the origins of the founder stock, the number and the importance of, introduction, uh, of the introduction and transfer attempts, and the diversity of the release sites. And of course, the peculiarities are indeed the advantages that being a brown trout gives you if you're down there living with the penguins. This is the most fantastic landscape. So hopefully um, my friend is on the call and uh, Matthew Bureau, who's uh, from one of the French agencies, he has the fantastic job of actually doing survey work down here. And Matthew was kind enough to give me some of these photographs just to give you an idea of what the landscape looks like. It reminds me, it's very, very similar to some of the areas I've uh, surveyed on the Kola Peninsula. But uh, again, similar enough to some of the photographs you see of the Falkland Islands, basically bare rock, Whatever little bit of food is in, is, is uh, 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 present in the rivers is providing the fry and the par with enough food to uh, at least get them out to sea. But again, as I say, a fantastic and a very, a very, very interesting landscape. But just look at the size of the trout, that uh, of the sea trout that are produced in this area. Obviously, these southern oceans are very, very rich. So 
again, analogous to the situation that we find in the Falklands, analogous to the situation that we find in New Zealand. So just a few parting thoughts then. So what have we got here? And this really goes to the heart of what John was speaking to us about last year. Um, are these trout morphs that I'm describing or are they different species? And as I mentioned on the Clutha River, just to repeat myself in New Zealand, uh, you have a situation there where you have all of the forms that you would normally um, expect to find in a plethora of different river systems. So on the Clutha, you have resident trout that stay resident. You have migratory trout that migrate within the river. You have migratory tra trout that migrate just to the estuary, and you have migratory trout that go through the estuary and out to the sea. So in 170 plus years, these fish have adapted into all of the niches that we assumed had taken 14,000 years. And again, going back to Ed and this suggestion that maybe we need to broaden our uh, thinking here uh, and not be too hung up about the coat and the color of the fish. Maybe we are looking at migratory trout. So I'm lucky enough when I go fishing, at certain times of the year, I can fish for cronine, gillaroo, dolahan, ferox, slob trout, sea trout, sonahan. All of these fish are available in a very small geographical area quite close to me here in Ireland. So this is an extraordinary array of different types, different morphs as such. But one uh, feature of this, which I think is really interesting, we always tend to think of these changes, these morphological changes as something that happened in the past. But I'm actually watching changes happen as I fish. So I'm watching active selection that's underway in our larger midland lakes. We have a pe very peculiar situation in Ireland where um, the non-native uh, roach, rudd and bream produce huge numbers of hybrids, massive numbers of very small uh, hybrids. And these are actually producing giant bait balls in these lakes. And I'm quite a keen pike angler. And we noticed maybe about 10, 12 years ago on the echo sounders that around these bait balls, there were different echoes coming at us, echoes that were quite different to the pike echoes that we had seen previously. And then we began to pick up some of these massive trout. And these big trout are harassing and constantly chasing these bait balls. These fish are not ferox. They're not biologically ferox trout, but they're spending what I would consider the bulk of their lives chasing fish. They have the teeth of a ferox. They have the shape of a, of a really, really well-fed brown trout. So what do we call them? Do we call them ferox? Do we call them brown trout? Do we put another name on them? So in my view, we are dealing here with one species from a biological point of view. I think we're dealing with one species, but I think we're thinking of fish, or we're dealing with fish rather, of a thousand coats, and indeed a thousand dif different adaptations. So just to give you an idea what, what some of these uh, fish feeding fish look like, this is a nice trout from uh, Loch Ree. So that, as you can see, I think in the photograph there, you just see the teeth on that particular fish. That fish would have arrived in that lake from the River Inney, expecting that it was going to live its life as a brown trout. So what is it now? What, what has it morphed into? What is it morphing into? And this one really blows my mind. What do we call this guy? So this is Matthew here. So we know that who's holding the fish. But this is back to my Kerguelen uh, Islands. Uh, this is the most beautifully marked fish from uh, an estuary. So what do we call this? Do we call this a sea trout? Do we call this a slob trout? Do we call this a brown trout? Or do we call it Salmotruta uh, kergulinensis? I mean, that's really, I think, what we have to debate tonight. Thank you very much. That was excellent, Ken, predictably excellent. Thank you so much.